Amen. Jesus is. What is Jesus to you? Uh, I hear everything and then I hear silence. So come on. Jesus has got to be something to us. Amen. And uh, so we're finding out exactly what Jesus is to us. And uh, we're taking all of the stuff that we've learned of, uh, from a child on up to our adulthood that has influenced uh, what we believe and what we think Jesus is. We're taking all that and putting it aside because some of that stuff is not even scriptural. Some of it is stuff we've made up. Some of it is stuff other people have made up. Some of it's not even true. Some of it's been added to. How many of you know that if, that if I went over here and I told Ron something, and he went and whispered in, in, in Fran's ear, and then Fran went and whispered in here, and then here, and then here, by the time it gets to the back, what I said is not even close. And so the teaching of Jesus has got passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down, and people continue to add their own stuff to where it's not even close sometimes to what Scripture says Jesus is. And so we're trying to get back and to really find out what the Bible says Jesus is. The first week we talked about Jesus was my best friend. Amen? He's more than qualified to be our best friend. Uh, you can get mad with him. You can scream at him. You can throw stuff in your room, and he's still going to be your best friend. You can yell at him a little bit, and he's still going to be your best friend. He's not going to get mad and run off and pout. He's going to sit there until you get through, and he says, now let me talk to you. And that's what a best friend should do. You know, uh, um, you know, I've seen over the years a lot of people say they're best friends, but then when the first little thing hits, all of them, I can't stand you. Well, what? You just said you were a BFF. Best, best friends forever. What happened to the forever part? Just because you get mad with me does not mean you have to disassociate with me. But now people are in your life for a season. <laughs> if you know anything about seasons, some people can help me get to where God wants me to hear. But then once I get there, there's somebody else to pick up and help me get to the next place that God wants me. And it's not necessarily the same people if they're not ready to go to the next place. And too many times we get caught staying behind when God's got a place for us up here because we don't want to leave those relationships. But how many of you know Jesus associated with a lot of people, but he only had 12 that he poured his, really poured his life into. And then out of those 12, he had three. And then out of those three, he had one. So every... <laughs> Everybody can't be your friend. Everybody, I'm just, can I just go ahead and burst your bubble up front? Everybody's not going to like you. I don't care how hard you try. I don't care if you'd give them a million dollars. There's people that still wouldn't like you. Give me that money. I don't like you. But they wouldn't. They'd, they'd take that money. But he was our best friend. We talked about how Jesus was our best. Week two, we talked about him as our teacher. Jesus is my teacher. Uh, he said when he descended into heaven, he said he left the Holy Spirit here. He left us a comforter, a guide, and a teacher. And we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. But here's an issue with the teacher. You've got to be able to hear the teacher. And we're going to get into more of that today with the shepherd because the sheep know the shepherd. There we go. So week two, we talked about him being our teacher. Last week, we talked about him being the miracle worker. And speaking of the miracle worker, do you want to hear a praise report? Ah, that wasn't enough people I ain't telling. Them. Do you really want to hear a great praise report? Yeah. I'm talking about a miracle from the Lord. <laughs> Here's a praise report. Uh, we've been praying for a little girl. I don't remember her name. Miss Kathy, if you want her name, Miss Kathy's got the name. But she was diagnosed with neuroblastoma. They went and they did the, uh, the, the, the bone marrow transfusion. Everything didn't look good. They didn't give her parents much hope, and they told her that probably she wouldn't survive. Well, she wasn't doing well. Her organs were shutting down, and then, uh, and then all of a sudden she started getting better. Well, this week they went and done all the scans for the cancer to see how much it had progressed and all that, and guess what they found? Nothing! What? They didn't find any cancer. God's still a miracle-working God. 
Remember the teenage girl that lives right here in Pillion that we've been praying for for months and months and months was diagnosed with the throat cancer and she had to go to Charleston and she had those procedures and I don't remember her name either and that's really bad. Um, Martin, there we go. Uh, we've been praying for her for quite a while. Well, at the donut fundraiser, they saw her mother yesterday and her mother said there's no cancer in her body anymore. What? She's still having some complications for some issues and for some stuff, but they didn't find any cancer. He's still our miracle worker. He can do it for you. He can do it for me. He can do it for others. And so we know Scripture says he's our best friend. Scripture says he's our teacher, and Scripture says he's our miracle worker. This week we're going to talk about Jesus as our shepherd. And look at your handout. And on your handout you have the uh, scripture that we've been using as a base scripture. And I'm going to read that, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 2. It's in the message translation on your notes. And I'll read that. You'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you, I didn't try to impress you. We need to get that through our heads. We don't need to impress anybody. I remember when I was dating my wife, I'd try to dress up, in which that wasn't very good because I was a country boy and I really didn't know what dressing up was. Dressing up to me was putting on a button-up shirt. <laughs> Instead of a T-shirt, that was dressing up. <laughs> but we just, we just need to stop trying to impress people because it doesn't matter. They're not going to be impressed most of the time. I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy, meaning I didn't try to seem more educated than you are. I deliberately kept it plain and simple, and I like that because I am a plain and simple guy. You set me down at the table with more than two or three pieces of silverware, I'll be lost. I'm just a plain. Give me what I need to eat with. Don't keep the rest of that stuff. <laughs> you just give me a fork and a spoon, and I'm good. I have my own pocket knife, so if I need a knife, I... come on, come on, somebody. You know I'm telling the truth. We said I didn't come polished speech, latest philosophy. I deliberately kept, deliberately kept it plain and simple. I preached first Jesus and who He is, and this is what we're talking about. First Jesus and who He. We got to preach Jesus and who He is. The people you associate with need to see Jesus in your life, and they need to see who he is in your life. You can't talk about Jesus being Lord of your life, and you live like Satan is the Lord of your life. Amen. First, Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, and then thirdly, Jesus and him crucified. That's pretty simple, isn't it? It's a pretty simple message that Paul came preaching. And so we need to really figure out who Jesus is in our own life. Uh, you know, he can be multiple things in our life. He doesn't have to be limited to one. I'm going to say it on this side. He don't have to be limited to one. He can be multiple things in your life. Today we're talking about Jesus as our shepherd. Look at your handout. John 10, verse 10 and 11. The thief comes only to do what? Kill and destroy. I have come, this is Jesus, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly or to its fullest. He says, I am the good what? Okay, okay. Uh, you can interact. When I ask questions, you can say stuff and it doesn't bother me. It's not going to interrupt. Matter of fact, it's going to make me preach better if you say stuff. Uh, because when you're quiet, I think I'm boring you. If I, if I see your head doing like this, I know that's not the Holy Spirit jerking your head. <laughs> so when you're talking to me, I, I, I know you're still there. He says, I am the good shepherd. And that's what we need to see him as, as the good shepherd. And in order for him to be the good shepherd, we got to have a connection with him, right? Come on, somebody. we got to have a connection with Jesus in order for him to be our shepherd. There is no sheep in the Bible that doesn't have a connection with their shepherd. There is no people in the kingdom of God that cannot have a relationship or a connection with Jesus. Because Jesus says, I am the way. And he's the only way. Yo, preacher, you're closed-minded. Yes, I am. 
Jesus said he's the only way to the Father. No one comes to the Father but through. He's the only way. I don't care, I don't care what you've been taught. I don't care what you've heard. I don't care what Ophir says. Ophir believed there's many ways to heaven. Jesus said there's one way to heaven. Because I am the good shepherd. We've got to have that connection. Uh, and when you look at the word connection, you've got to know that it describes a relationship that we've got to have with Jesus. I want to ask you a question this morning. How is your relationship with Jesus? Do you talk to him every day or do you ignore him when he calls you? <laughs> you know, when your phone rings and you've got the cell phone, these smartphones, I know why they call them smartphones because they're a whole lot smarter than me. When you've got these smartphones and when that thing rings, I look at it and it has Answer or what? Ignore. Mine has ignore on it. So when Jesus is calling you, are you answering him or are you hitting the ignore? Oh, Lord, I ain't got time for that. Beep. There's a lot of us that do that. Lord, I'll answer you when I get time. <laughs> no, you won't. You'll do it on his time. Come on, somebody. And so His time is not our time. And sometimes we think his time is off, but his time is always right. So we got to have that connection with them. Connection is relationship. Connection is fellowship. And if we're having fellowship, that means we're spending time together in each other's presence, right? When's the last time you really got in the Lord's presence and spent time with him? Come on, somebody. When is the last time you just went in your room, left your cell phone somewhere else, left your husband or your wife somewhere else, and said, hey, you take care of the kids for a little bit. I need like 15, 20 minutes with me and the Lord. When have you just went in there and fellowship with the Lord and said, this is my time, and this is my time with the Lord, and I need this because he's my shepherd, and if I don't do this, he can't be my shepherd? And we need it so badly. And then we're also the body of Christ. We are the flock of his sheep pen. Um, when I did the teaching on John 10, 10 back several years ago, I told you that being called a sheep is not a, com is not a uh, compliment. Sheep are not smart. <laughs> I relate to the sheep because <laughs> I'm not smart. <laughs> Me and sheep get along good because I'm not the smartest. Not the brightest crayon in the box, sharpest knife in the drawer, whatever you want to call it. But I'm okay with that. Because that's the way God made me. And I need to be okay with God made me. Psalms 100 verse 3, know the Lord is good. Do you know that he's good this morning? Do you really know that he's good this morning? Know the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. You see, you're not your own. The Bible says you're not your own. You were bought with the price, and it's the blood of Jesus. You are not your own. We are his people and the sheep of his what? We are his sheep <laughs> of his pastor, meaning a fenced-in place, meaning that the sheep need boundaries. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Are you feeling me? The sheep need boundaries because if you ain't got a fenced in place, the sheep just going to run all over the place and they're going to get in so much trouble. And the shepherd's not going to be able to keep up with them. If you got a hole in the fence and they get out, you got to go. We just, we, just, we just sang about Jesus leaving the 99, going to find them. <laughs> Come on, somebody. The sheep need boundaries. And that's what pastor infers pastor fenced in place uh, I don't see many farmers letting their cows just run loose with no fence huh only thing I see running loose with no fence is chickens <laughs> and a lot of them get squashed in the road hmm. so we are the sheep of his pastor um the word shepherd, when you look at it in the original text, the closest English word that we can come up with it for shepherd is pastor. So actually what this is saying is Jesus is my pastor. <laughs> come on, somebody. 
I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but how do you treat your pastor? Some pastors aren't treated too good. You treat me good. I'm just going to say, you treat me good. You say, well, preacher, you would tell us who treated you bad because you're passing off. You treat me bad, I'm going to tell you. This pastor will tell you. <laughs> but that's the closest English word we can get to shepherd is pastor. Jesus is my pastor. And if I've got a pastor that I really trust, that means I can confide in him, right? That means I can tell him things. And I don't have to worry about it getting out on the street. Jesus is my pastor. He is the one. First Peter 5, 2 and 4 says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. He's talking to pastors. Serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing. As God wants you to be. Not greedy for money. Because Lord knows everybody thinks the pastor's got to stay poor and humble. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you know, that used to be an old thing. It used to be an old saying, oh, we can't pay him that kind of money. You can't pay him too much. He ain't going to be humble no more. You got to keep it. it. Just because you're poor doesn't make you humble. It makes you hungry. And when you get hungry, you do crazy stuff. Yeah, you get hangry. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, and because you, not, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. A shepherd is a servant. I'm just going to throw that out there. A shepherd is a servant. A pastor is a servant. Because Jesus said, I didn't come to serve, uh, I didn't come to be served, but I come to serve. Uh, so pastors are servants. We serve. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, we're supposed to get in there and help. Uh, yes, you're supposed to follow us, but we're supposed to be setting an example for our sheep. Amen? And I can't sit in my office and tell you what to do if I'm not willing to get out there and do it myself. Because that's not really leading you by example. That's just telling you what to do. Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not into that. Uh, matter of fact, they, they, they went to the office the other week, and they organized those storage units back there, and they told me not to come, and I, and I, and I, I felt bad for not being there. Because I'm like, Lord, my, my, my people are out there. I need to go out there too. But somebody told me not to show up, <laughs> and I was scared. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't show up, and they did a great job. They did a great job organizing there. So, so they can do stuff without me. But I have to lead by example. Amen? You have to lead by example. We talked, about, we talked about this the other week. You can't tell your children what to do. You need to show them what to do. It's not a do as I say mentality. It's a do as I do mentality. And if they see, if they see you in a nasty attitude, they're going to have a nasty attitude. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd comes, meaning when Jesus comes, when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. He is not just a shepherd. He is the shepherd. He is the pastor of pastors. He is the shepherd of shepherds. The Bible says he is the Lord of lords. He is the king of all kings. Every knee at some point is going to bow to him and confess that he is Lord. I don't want to be made to bow my knee to him and confess that he is Lord. I'm going to do that on my own. Because, you know, if people make you do stuff, you get angry. Or at least I do. Isn't it? Don't, 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 you better be going to, <laughs> don't make, uh -uh. you know, that ain't going to work too good. He's the shepherd. I, I, want, I want us to look real quickly at Psalms 23. Anybody know Psalms 23? What does it start out, what does it start out with? The Lord is my 
Come on, somebody. I, I want you to read. I'm going to read this whole psalm, and I want you to read it with me. I, I want us all to read this because there's some stuff in there. I'm going to pull from this right here. I'm going to pull from this passage right here, everything that we're going to talk about. There's six or seven things we're going to talk about real quickly that the shepherd is in our life. It comes straight out of here, and I want you. I want us all to read it. So I'm, I'm going to read, and I want you to read with me. If, they, if it's on your handout, it's on the screen. There's multiple places. Uh, you can look at it in your Bible if you have it in your Bible. And this is the New King James Version in your handout notes. So let's read this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can I get an amen? Man, there is so much packed into those six verses. We don't have enough time to unpack all of it because there is so much in there. But he starts out with saying, the Lord is my shepherd. This is King David writing this. The psalmist is going, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, sometimes we just need to stop and confess that he's our shepherd. That the Lord is our shepherd. Sometimes we don't even, you know, sometimes we just say, oh, 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 uh, uh, the man upstairs. What? What? Come on, somebody. If you're going to be a Jesus follower, then talk about Jesus. Don't talk about the man upstairs. We got to get past that. It's, it's, oh, 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 oh the, good, the good man up there. Come on. We got to confess, the Lord is my shepherd. And if he's my shepherd, that means he leads me. That means he guides me. That's all kind of meaning in that. We got to start confessing, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> what do you think if we went out here to the red light in Pillion right down here? What if you think if a couple of us went out there and when the cars pull up, we go, the Lord's my shepherd. What do you think they'd do? They'd hit that button and go, that window would go up. You know why? Because that makes people uncomfortable. And the reason we say, oh, uh, you know, uh, the, the man ups. It makes us uncomfortable talking about the Lord. Why, if you're a Christ follower, you've accepted him into your heart, why does it make you uncomfortable to talk about Jesus? But we got to confess that he is our Shepherd, look at your hand up. And while you're looking at that, I just want to ask you this very point blank personal question. Is Jesus your shepherd this morning? If he's not your shepherd, I want to introduce him to you. The best decision you'll ever make is to get into the sheep of his pastor, as he puts it. The best decision you'll ever make in your life. Number one, the shepherd provides. <laughs> he provides for us. Uh, you may say, oh, pastor, you just don't know. You don't know how lacking I am. Uh, you don't know how many times I haven't had anything. You don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know the financial need that's been there, and I just haven't had it. I want to I, I tell you this this morning, and I want to tell you this with all love. Difficulty does not mean lack. Just because you're having a difficult time does not mean you're lacking. Because a lot of people that don't have much money, they still have clothes on their back, and I still see them eating food. So just because you're in difficult times does not mean you're lacking. And if you are lacking, it may be because of a decision you made to do something with your own provision. Hmm. You could have paid your light bill when you went out and bought those $150 pair of tennis shoes. Hmm. 
you see me pay $150 for a pair of tennis shoes, you better, you better be calling an ambulance because I'm about to have a heart attack. I'm not saying the shoes aren't worth it. I'm just saying this old boy ain't paying $150 for a pair of tennis shoes. But preacher, you just don't know how they wear I'm not going to find out either. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. What does it say? I shall not want. What does it say? I shall not. That means I'm, I'm, I'm not going to want for anything. Yeah, I've, I've hit a place in my life where I don't want a whole lot. There was a time in my life when I wanted everything. That's my wife. <laughs> I want cars, I want trucks, four-wheelers, guns, bows, you name it. The latest this, the latest that, you name it. There was, there was a time in my life where I wanted it. But the Lord, the Lord says, I am your shepherd and you shall not want. You know, the Bible says he knows what you need before you ever ask it. And if he didn't provide for our needs, to me, that would make him a child abuser. Am I correct? If you withhold a need from your child that you know that is there, what, what is that? I'm not talking about after they get to be adults and they're coming mooching off you. I'm not talking about that. That's totally different. Then yeah, you don't need to be giving them. Yeah, you, go get you a job. Get out this house. Go earn your own money and pay your own bills. He's our shepherd. We shall not want. Philippians four thirteen four nineteen says this, and my God will meet all your and my needs according to what. According to his, his glorious riches or his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He's going to meet my need according to what he has in heaven. And we know he's got a lot in heaven because the streets are paved with gold. Walls made of jasper, gates made out of pearls. That's, that's some high dollar stuff. So he said, I'll meet your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Catch this. Catch this. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd, I shall not want. But catch this. The flow of provision will continue as long as you stay under the umbrella of the shepherd. I don't think some of you got that. We think the shepherd is supposed to provide for us no matter how we're living. Huh? Come on. Come on, somebody. We think, we think God is supposed to provide for us no matter how we're living. But if I am sheep in his pasture, he's going to provide for me as long as I'm in those boundaries. And his provision will keep flowing. But when I get outside of those boundaries, his provisions aren't there. And there's a lot. Oh, did I say that, Lord? Did I not say that? Did I say that? Did I not say that? Help me say it in love, Lord. There's a lot of people that move from church to church to church to church and they're lacking. It's because they're not in the right pastor. You see, because God has assigned you to a pastor over a church. Not a green pastor, but a pastor over a church. And some people move from place to place to place to place because they get unhappy with their shepherds, so to speak, because he's not doing the things they want him to do. He's not uh, 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 spending enough time with them. He won't do the, uh, all the stuff that they want done at every minute, and they're just not happy with him, so they run off somewhere else. When God has assigned them over here, and you go to somebody else's pastor, you're not going to reap the same provisions. you got to stay. In the boundaries of the shepherd for your provision. You see, we don't understand that. We, don't un you, we think we can go from this church to the other church and still have the provisions of the Lord. Not if this is where God has assigned your pastor at. Come on, somebody. I'm, tr I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to teach myself something here. It's because wherever God has assigned me, that's where my provision's at. As long as I stay under the umbrella of the shepherd or the boundary of the shepherd, that's where all my provisions is going to be. But when I step outside of that, he is not obligated to provide me anything. 
Oh, preacher, you're getting too hard. I am getting hard, but I want us to learn from this because he's our shepherd and he wants to take care of us. But he set boundaries for us. Preacher, what boundaries are you talking about? I'm talking about the boundaries in this word. He loves you enough to go after you when you break out of the boundaries and he'll come find you and bring you back. But what happens if you break out of the boundaries and you don't want to be brought back? Do you think he's going to bring you kicking and screaming? He's going to leave you over there for a time and let you do on your own. And when you start starving, and when you start lacking, then you'll cry out to him. Come on, somebody. The flow of provision will continue as long as we stay under the umbrella of the shepherd. We don't like this, but that means we have to follow instructions. What does instructions mean? Instructions mean that somebody's going to tell us what to do. <laughs> How many in here like for people to tell you what to do? Not many of it. Not many. How many like for your, your supervisor on your job to come tell you what to do? You'll sit there and listen, but you don't really like it. You want me to tell you something we even like less? It's when the pastor at the church where you're at just tell you something that you need to do. You know what you're going to do? You're going to bite him. Because you don't like it. <laughs> sheep bite, I'm going to tell you that. Go find, go, find a, go find somebody that's got sheep and they'll tell you sheep bite their shepherd when he's trying to inspect them. Because it's the shepherd's duty to inspect the sheep. I got to move on. What time am I? Oh, I got to roll here. Mm -hmm. Number two, the, sh the, the shepherd restores. He restores. Uh, difficulty sucks the energy out of us, and we need restoring. Amen? Sometimes circumstances in our life hit us unexpectedly, and it takes all of our wind out. Am I, can anybody say amen to that? Anybody ever had the wind sucked out of them? And we need restoring. Uh, we, we need somebody to come with the air compressor and pump us back up. We need to be restored. The psalmist said, he makes me, in Psalm 23, the psalmist says, he makes me to lie down. <laughs> Isn't that odd terminology to you? He makes me to lie down. You know why I think he's saying that? It's because he knows that we won't lay down on our own if he doesn't make us lay down. You ever tried to put a child down for a nap? What do you have to do most of the time? You have to make them lie down. So in order for us to get restoring, sometimes Jesus has to make us lay down. He has to make us stop so that he can restore us and put back in us the wind that the circumstances of life has blown out of us. John 15, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Man, I constantly need this verse. Because some things, some things hit me that I wasn't expecting and, and, and it just knocks the air out of me and, and, I, I, and I just constantly think about it. And you know when you start constantly thinking about something, that's called what? There you go. It's called worrying. And what good does worry do? It doesn't do you any. It gets wrinkles in your face and gray hair on your head. Causes your health problems. That's what worrying does. But Jesus says, peace I leave with you. <laughs> he is going to restore us by giving us peace. Sometimes we can't go to sleep at night because our mind is just so perplexed with the things that life has thrown at us. And it's going and going and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking on the things that have happened during the day. And you can't go to sleep. But Jesus said, I have given you peace. He's going to rest in my peace. Not in your peace or your peace or your peace or my peace. He goes, he goes, rest in his 
peace is what he's saying. Rest, rest, rest. So he has to make us lie down. And then he says, not only do I make you lie down, but I lead you to green pastures. And why does he lead us to green pastures? It's because the green pastures where the food at, and he takes us there and makes us lie down, and we're right there where the food is, and we can feed ourselves. And when we get fed, we get what? We get strengthened, don't we? Any, any, anybody ever, uh, uh, you ever been so hungry that you got weak or nauseous? Especially, especially if you're a diabetic, you know what I'm talking about. You, you've got to eat every so often because if you don't, your sugar levels drop. And then, man, you just get so weak you can't even hold it. And some of you, and you pass out. So you, you, you have to watch that. So you have to eat so that you can be restored. He says, I make you lie down in green pastures. He didn't say, I'll make you lie down in green pastures so I can hand feed you. You know, there's some things we have to do for ourselves. And feeding ourselves is one of them, unless you've got a handicap. But if you're not handicapped, you shouldn't be hand fed. Mm. Mm. When was the last time the Lord made you lie down in a green pasture so that you could be restored? Do you remember the last time that he did that? Because all of us need restoring at some point. Because we all get tired, life throws things our way, and we need the nourishment from the green pastures so that we can be restored and get up and go. And what and one of the meanings of restore, it really, it really means to return back to the moment of departure. So wherever my strength left, when I, when I get the nourishment, I get returned back to that point. Unless I'm doing steroids and then I go back. <laughs> Number three, the shepherd leads. The shepherd leads. Number three, the shepherd leads. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Do you know there's a path out there that the Lord has set for you, but you have to find that path? Um, I don't want to. I don't want to go too deep and to try to blow your mind, but I do want you to understand this. When we volunteer in ministry and we try different things, you know what we're actually doing? We're trying to find the path that God has for us. You, you, you see what I'm saying? You've got to actually do something to try to find the path. You just can't sit there and go, God, show me my path. He's not going to show you your path. You're going to have to be doing something, and then he'll show you what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, if you go back there and you work with the nursery and you go, oh, Jesus, my nerves are tore all up. I don't think I can. Then you know that that's not your path. But by the way, our, volu- our volunteers are great. And we always would love to have more volunteers. And that's the best way you can find your... And, and, and this, is, this is probably the number two question I get. Because I just don't know what the Lord wants to do for me. Well, what are, you, are you actively pursuing anything? What are you trying out? Try some stuff. Go get in connection and ministry with Mr. Randall and try some stuff. He's got a whole bunch of positions there that you can try out. Tammy's got some positions. Teaching, helpers, nursery. Set up and tear down. There's a lot of different things that we, uh, when you, I mean, there's just so men, women's ministry, oh my God, missions. There's just so much that we can get involved in the community. What are you doing to pursue your path to find out, Lord, where am I? Don't raise your hand, but I'm not, there's a lot of you in here that's asking, I just don't know where I fit. But you never try anything. I love you, but you got to try something in order to know where you fit and where you don't fit. I mean, you know, if you get hired at somewhere and you go and you try that position and you train for a little while and you can tell that that is not what you want to do for the next however many years of your life, what are you going to do? We're going to go find you something else. Volunteering is the same way in ministry. Let me try it. If it doesn't work, let me try something else. We'll keep trying you at positions until we find the path that God has for you because there is a place. But the problem is, is a lot of us don't want to let, uh, let him lead us. We want to go to where we want to go and not let him lead us. A shepherd leads us. He 
is the one that leads us. He is the one that's supposed to be guiding my way and taking me to the places he wants me to go. Look at John 10, verse 3 through 5. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. His sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. You get that? They will never follow a stranger. Remember a while ago I said a lot of people go from church to church to church and they just feel unfulfilled and they just don't feel like they fit in? It's because they've got out from under their shepherd's voice and everybody else's voice is a stranger. So if you're watching this online, this is what I want to tell you. Come home to your pastor. Listen to the voice of your pastor wherever he's at and go back to him and submit to him and do what he asks. Amen? We got to let him lead. You know, they listen. He calls them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they don't recognize his voice. God leads us how? How does God lead us? God lead, He's not physically here, so how does God lead us? By his voice. That's why it's so important to hear the voice of the Lord. It's because that's how he leads you. And can I tell you that sometimes he leads you through other people. That's why they put pastors like myself in the churches. It's to try to lead people. So sometimes God's not the one doing it, but sometimes it's the voice of the person on the stage. And please, just because you get mad with the voice on the stage, don't run off. Because I can tell you there'll be many more opportunities for us to get mad at each other. There'll be many more opportunities for us not to agree with each other. But that doesn't mean we have to run off from each other. That just means we just work for the kingdom even harder. Amen? Number four, the shepherd supports us. He supports. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He supports us in difficult times. Second Timothy 4, it says no one, come, uh, no one came to support. You ever felt like this? This verse, I, man, I'm telling you, have you ever felt like this verse? No one came to my support. But everyone deserted me, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. You ever felt like that a lot of times? Uh, because there's been some times I felt like there was people that were supposed to be right beside me and helped be my strength, and when I turn around, all I see is them running the other way. I'm like, hey, hey. But the Lord didn't run off and leave me. He's the one that gave me the strength, and he'll never leave you. He is your support system. When you don't feel like you have a support system, he is your support system. When your family's not supporting you, he will. <laughs> Number five, the shepherd defends us. Man, I wish I had like two hours to stay here on this. Because this is what he says in Psalms 23. He says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. <laughs> you see, a lot of times, and, and, and several years ago when I went through the, the, the John 10 teaching of all the stuff that was in John 10, I talked in, intensively about the rod and the staff and what they, were, what they were used for. And most people, when you think of a rod, you think of punishment, right? But I want you to understand what the psalmist is saying here. He said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <laughs> If that rod's a symbol of punishment, how is that going to comfort me? That's going to make me afraid, is it not? So this is what I want to tell you this morning. That rod is not meant for you. It's meant for your enemy. Huh? Come on, somebody. That rod is meant for the enemy that's attacking you. Do you need correction? Absolutely you need correction. And so do I. The man standing on the stage or the woman standing on the stage, whoever a pastor may be, they are not above correction. John 10, 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, he, he fights for you. 
And Romans 8.31 says, I don't think you guys have this. And Romans 8.31 says, if God be for me, come on, somebody shout that out. If God be for me, oh, that, that's still weak. If God be for me, come on, somebody. Really, really, I want you to say it like you really mean it. You're not saying it. Say it like, say it like your favorite ball team just won the game. If God be for me. He fights for me. Number six, the shepherd blesses. The shepherd blesses. Do you know God is a giver? God is a giver. John 3.16 tells us that. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. God is a, he's a, he's a giver. Hebrews 13, may the God of peace who through the blood of eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with every good every good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever and ever if I could have the band to come back up the Lord blesses us we did a study on this on Wednesday night going through the prayer of Jabez and when you start using the word bless blessing blesses you are invoking the supernatural favor of God. It's not just a, achoo, God bless you. That, that's half-hearted. That has nothing to do with what the actual meaning of blessed blessing has. The true meaning is that you are asking God for supernatural favor for whoever you're trying to bless. And that's what Jabez was doing. He said, Lord, bless me. Bless me indeed. And we need to understand that our God will bless us above and beyond what we can ask, think, or imagine. I was given a word for somebody, and I want to read this to you. I don't know who you are, but this is for you. This is for you. And whoever you are, you're a mother. Whoever you are, you're a mother. God says you're not alone. You're doing a great job, so stop doubting. I've given you all the tools you need to do what needs to be done. You are my child, and I love you unconditionally. Wow. I'm going to say that again. You're my child. And I love you unconditionally. All you need is to accept my plan for you and those babies. Teach them of my love, and I will do the rest. Sit at my feet and relax. Mom, I don't know who you are, but that's for you. Sounds like you've been stressing. You've been doubting. You've been wondering. And God is telling you that he's equipped you to do what he's called you to do. So do it. What is our response as God being our shepherd? What is our response? Our response is that we should know the shepherd. We should know the shepherd. We should know the shepherd. You see, if I don't know the shepherd, I can't hear his voice. If I don't know the shepherd, I can't let him lead me. If I don't know the shepherd, he's not going to provide for me. If I don't know the shepherd, he's not going to defend me. If I don't know the shepherd, he's not going to encourage me. If I don't know the shepherd, he's not going to heal me. We have to know. John 10, 14, I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. I've got the privilege this morning.
praying for somebody that came to me before service ever started. And this is what they said. They said, Pastor, I was listening to a song this week. And some of the lyrics of the song says, I love you and I'll see you again. And he said, it was like the Lord said, if you don't change your life, you're not going to see me. And he said, so this morning I want to be prayed for. And I want to change my life so that I know I'm going to see him. And we have the privilege of doing that this morning. I don't know about you, but that excites me. And it overwhelms me all at the same time. Because I'm like, Lord, you still use us even when we think we're unusable. He still uses us. I'm going to call him up. And we're going to pray for him this morning. He's going to stand right here in front of me. You know, it, it, it takes a bold person to go, Pastor, I need to be prayed for. My life needs to change if I'm going to see Jesus. his dad's feeling right now, but I know how I'm feeling. <laughs> right where you're at, I just want you to stretch your hands this way. And I'm going to place my hand on him. And we're going to pray for him and we're going to pray with him. Lord, thank you James, thank you for the courage you gave him to realize that his life needs to change so that one day he can see you face to face, Father. Lord, I ask that your spirit go from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Awaken every gift that you've placed on the inside of him and use him for the kingdom of God. And everybody in the house, repeat this after me. Father, forgive me. Lead me. Guide me. Provide for me. I surrender to you in Jesus name somebody give him a shout this morning come on somebody come on somebody hallelujah thank you Lord um, I just got word that Miss Jackie Green's husband has been admitted to the hospital um, something called diverticulitis and enlarged liver. I mean, you know, God can heal that. God can heal that. So we're going to pray for him right now, right where you're seated. Do you know we don't have to be there for God to do the healing? Raise your hands right where you're at. Lord, we come in agreement. Your word says where two or three come in agreement touching any one thing that it shall be done. So, Lord, we come in agreement this morning for Jackie Green's husband that you will remove that diverticulitis, that you will cause his liver to shrink to normal size, God, and it will function just the way you created it to function, Father. Lord, I thank you for your miracle-working power. God, we thank you for the reports that we heard this morning about you working miracles in people's lives. And, Lord, may your kingdom come on earth. And may your will be done. Use us, God your glory. Stand to your feet this morning as we sing.